This is the Throstle Club with Norman Bartlam and Bob Downing. Thank you. Now, regular listeners will know that we recently spoke to the veteran reporter uh, Rob Bishop. You about his... said my name then, didn't you? I, I did. I did. <laughs> almost called <laughs> you, you a veteran. veteran, that's why. veteran yeah. Yeah. Veteran reporter Fancy Rob calling Bishop. calling you a veteran now. <laughs> <laughs> about his career and he was reporting for the Sports Argus and the Birmingham Post in particular we ran out of time with him then and there was of course there's no stop press on the radio so we, we had to stop him talking in his prime but after the programme we recorded a bit more of his stories and here was a selection a montage if you like oh, oh, are, are, we allowed, me. are we allowed to say such posh just words? get me the thesaurus out <laughs> here we don't black use that on black country extra so uh, a montague yeah, it, it, better. It, it, it includes that defeatist incident that uh, we mentioned earlier, and he also uh, talks about Bobby Gould in his relationship with the Sports Argus, and in particular the reporter Steve Todgay. But first, the day he played on the Hawthorns pitch. I started covering uh, Albion, Villa, Wolves, Blues, etc., uh, for the Argus and the Mail uh, in '87. And I've got to be honest, I didn't really want to. I was very, very comfortable doing non-league. As, you know, that, I had Hal Zone and Will and All uh, with their trips to Wembley. And I, I really liked the scene. And to be honest, I'd lost touch with top-level football and what, what was going on. And I didn't feel confident at all. But anyway, I, I, was, I had to do it because uh, a lad called Ralph Ellis had gone to the Daily Star. So I moved into uh, head office in Birmingham. And one of my first memories of uh, that that winter was Boxing Day at the Hawthorns. Um, played Millwall and we lost four uh, one. But I sat in the the, the press box with uh, tracksuit bottoms and football boots because at half time there was a penalty competition, <laughs> and I think it was just with other uh, media people. And I then I think I got an idea that day what you know what, how intimidating it can be on that pitch with a crowd. Uh, because I stepped up at the Brummy Road end to take my first penalty, and I've got all these people laughing, and, <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, no. And I, I tried to be clever and stroke it, and the pick keeper just picked it up. <laughs> and then, then I tried the other side, and he picked it up again. I, I, it was getting very embarrassing, so the third row I thought, right, I'm just going to hammer this one. And he just tipped it over nonchalantly, as if it yeah. was. But anyway, that was... It was a bit of it's fun, a great you know. experience. Yeah, yeah, just to just to stand there, I'm thinking, well, you know, what what must it be like? You know, you got to. We take it for granted. You just watch pros play, but you know, I don't think I'd want to be doing that regularly. Yeah. But uh, um, about a year later, <clears throat> the the Argus at the time used to have a morning edition, mm. and we always used to do a little preview with a, a forecast of the result of the game you were covering. And I went Albion 3, Crystal Palace 2. Because Albion were doing OK, Palace were up the top, scoring lots of goals. Um, and just before half-time, it was nil-nil. No, neither side looking like they would score. And the, one of my colleagues turned around and he said, your 3-2 three, doesn't look very optimistic, does it? I said, what? Well, no, to be fair. As it was, the Baggies did score just before half-time. And they ended up 5-3. And yeah. Don Goodman got a hat-trick, so... Yeah. So that turned that around. Um, a decade on, <coughs> I, was, I was talking about um, uh, when you're giving opinions and views for the paper, the Sunday people used to, um, they had marks out of 10, which I always thought was a bit unfair because, you know, who, who can say, you, you, how can you, you watch one player and rate exactly what he's done for 90 minutes but anyway that's what they did and at Port Vale uh, there was a game against the Baggies where early second half uh, nil nil but but the Sunday people wanted the score so the guy covering the match had to give his marks out of 10 for the two teams uh, and then out of the blue Lee Hughes scores a hat-trick in no time <laughs> and at the end of the match we're all doing our reports and I'll never forget hearing this guy Desperately phoning uh, the sports desk and saying at other Sunday people and saying that the marks for Port Vale against West Brom can you change Hughes from a six to a nine? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that was yeah. quite something. I mean, when the Argus as well, we had to um, we had to do a man of the match, didn't we, or a yeah, player yeah. And, a, and a mark out of ten, and a mark out of ten. 
And uh, I mean, he got because at, at the end of the season, whoever mm. got the most marks mm. had won a trophy, yeah. won the Sports Argus trophy. Um, and <laughs> it was funny because Paul Marston, a great reporter, Walsall. He, was, he covered Warsaw. But he was picking the same guy every week. <laughs> Making sure he won it. He was picking the same guy every week. So we thought, we, we, well, we've got to do something about this. He was going to He's going to be... I mean, in a month, he would have won three. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't Tony play Ma- one of the games. Tony, what was his name? Tony Madden? Yes, yeah. Tony yeah, Madden, like that? But he was a midfield player. But, I mean, he was a good player. But, I mean, let's face it, he was in the second or third division. And you know, our lot were in the first division. It was a bit, bit, bit different. But um, so we all, the the rest of us, you know, we almost decided, you know, we got to start picking just one man. But I mean, it, it became a joke. You know, you couldn't, yeah, you couldn't keep doing it every week. I, I don't think it's a good system. It's you know, it's uh, yeah. I think you, you give an opinion, but a, a mark sort of, sort of almost sort of that that defines what you've done. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. People who always used to like the Argus <laughs> having the form rate, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, except on one occasion, yeah, exactly. Bob, Bob will tell you. <laughs> At the end of the game, I mean, there was now you know they have press conferences and media suites and, and whatever else. <clears throat> but at that time, when I was covering them, and you know when Rob was doing it as well, we we interview the manager at the end of the game, but we'd always go down to the Europa Lodge because that's where we knew Ron been going, and some of. And some of the players, so to have, just to have a drink. So we used to make our way down there for the match, after the match rather, to get some quotes. And the Argus, the the, the Argus, you always used to bring about six or seven papers down because they knew you know where they were, and they used to bring about six or seven, as I say, down to the, the Europa Lodge. And this one game, Albin had then played too badly, but Neil Harmon, another. Tremendous journalist who, uh, who was on the mail, who later became the tennis correspondent for the Times. Um, he he gave Albion a form rate of fair, and Ron had been waxing lyrical about how th- how well he thought Albion had played. So we're discussing this, and all of a sudden Neil Harmon walks into the Europa, and Big Ron has got a copy in his hand of the Sports Argus. He rolled it up. <coughs> And he looked at him, he said, f- f- fair, fair, Armin, fair. <laughs> and he hit him on the back of the head with this rolled-up copy of the um, Sports Argus. Unfortunately, Neil's glasses weren't securely locked to his ear holes. <laughs> so they went flying across the bar and finished up in the optics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you're talking about <laughs> that, that sort of managerial quirk, if you like, that I think when it comes to eccentric ones, oh, uh, Bobby, Bobby Gould. Gould. Um, I mean, I could recall when he even went through a phase where we all had to go after the game, not into any sort of press room, but into the dressing rooms yeah. f- to do the interviews, which which wasn't very clever when you wear glasses. Isn't it? Yeah. They're coming out of the showers and you, you, well, your glasses, glasses steam up. But he he did have a it, his pet hate, obviously. Obviously, Ron had got the thing about Neil and that that fair comment. Um, his the reporter he he had a go at was a lad called Steve Tudgate. Oh yes, who was quite well known in, yeah. in West Bromway. And uh, uh, Steve made the mistake of describing Bobby quite rightly, I would think, as eccentric. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bobby took exception and banned him. Um, and then the the mail decided we wouldn't speak to Bobby Gold either. And so Bob tried to ring me several times. I was told I couldn't talk to him, so he then used to uh, fax me the, the squads. Uh, but they, the mail still, it got it got really silly, got out of hand, and the mail, and it, I, I thought this wasn't, it was a gimmick, but it wasn't really very responsible, uh, had a space at the top of the pay, back page with a headline, uh, this is where the Albion news should be, and then it was just totally blank, and I thought, well, you know, we've made the point, we know we've got an issue, but mm-hmm. it, it just it just continued, and... I tried to resolve it. Uh, I took Steve down to the Hawthorns and we, well, again, we went in the dressing room for this meeting with Bob and the players. And it was almost like a courtroom. All, all the players sat around in their normal spots and there was a table in the middle and I sat on one side with Steve, Bobby Gold was on the other and, I th- and we were sort of being interrogated. And, oh, yeah. and 
Well, we, we, again, it achieved nothing. And the, the only player who actually spoke out, because Bob said, they all feel the same, all the lads. Come on then, lads, speak up. And the only one who did was Graham Roberts, the ex-Tottenham player. And he, he made his point, and, but none of the others said a word. But so what was Graham Roberts saying then? Well, basically, that he thought he was unfair. On you know, his his reporting had been unfair, and he shouldn't have been saying it. It was, it was all a bit silly. But the the ironic thing was that when it eventually got resolved, we had a picture in the Argus of Steve and Bobby Gold sitting in the Halfords Lane stand, eating fish and chips, and the, you know, this is like the peace no, no, offering. No. It was it was just a total fiasco. It was no, no, ridiculous. No. They obviously thought it was good publicity for each other at the time. Yes, so. yes. It, and the, you know, it was, it I mean, there was that <laughs> famous thing as well when he had one of the supporters going to the dressing room. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, was, I mean, was it the Dent Bournemouth? Mick Caldicott, yeah. 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 Were you there? Then? I, was, I was standing outside, because, again, uh, probably because Bournemouth didn't have the facilities for post match interviews at, at that time. And we stood just to the. The, the dressing room door was on our right in the corridor and we were just waiting and waiting and then suddenly the door opened and gold emerged and we all thought yeah, we're in now but instead of turning our way he turned right and then right again going out of the ground and the next thing we knew he came back frog marching this enormous guy this big two down, turned out to be a big caldicott and um, he pushed him into the dressing room I mean again this was crazy and we heard him then say, right, you've had your go. He'd been shouting at them through a frosted window outside. He said, right, you've had your go there. Now tell them to their faces. And to be fair, the guy did. He went through it all again, <laughs> told them what he thought of them. Because I think they only lost 2-1, but they were having a bad time. And uh, it, was, it was a crazy situation when you think back. Another one that crops up in my mind was an Easter Monday game against Crew. We lost 5-1, and Denny Smith was manager then. And again, we had the post-match interviews, and Fabian De Freitas, the, stri the Dutch striker, oh, right. hadn't... Oh, is that the well, day when he didn't turn yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he, 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 I think he did turn he up in the end. Late, but turn up late, very yeah. late. He didn't really... Well, basically, we, we asked the question, why didn't De Freitas play today? Um, and... I think most managers there they would have just managed, you know, got a bit of a knock or whatever. But Dennis Smith, totally honest, he said he thought it was an evening kickoff. Apparently, they don't have bank holidays in Holland. <laughs> 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 he said so. He had turned up, but the team sheet had already been put in by the time he, he arrived there, and absolutely crazy. I'm just, I'm just thinking of another one. The, the, the things come in your head over the years that. Uh, there was one game against Ipswich where uh, their reporter, Dave Allard, do you remember yeah, him? Yeah, remember Dave Allard, yeah. yeah. Very brash sort of guy, mm -hmm. wouldn't he? And he, told, he says, Rob, he said, tell all your mates, get, get the money on a guy called Klaus Thompson to score, the, the Danish player, to score the first goal. Uh, he's normally a centre-back, but I'm told he's <coughs> going to play attacking midfield today. And, he, and he, he takes penalties as well. So, great. And he's 40-1. to one. So... Uh, I told all the lads, and we all had a little bet on it. I think I put a quid on. Yeah. Anyway, it was nil-nil, and this guy never went over the halfway line anyway. <laughs> he, did, he stayed at the back. And funnily enough, a, a, a couple of days later, I was telling, um, it, was a, it was a Villa shareholder, cause, who I knew, knew liked to bet. Um, and I said, I, I said, I had a bit of a bet on Saturday, but it was a total disaster. It was this Klaus Thompson, and etc. And he said, oh, yes, I had a pound bet on Saturday. On Frankie de Tori's seven. <laughs> <laughs> he won 17 and a half grand yeah. for 92p. I was there. Yeah, 90p. I mean, Unbelievable. I mean, it, 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 it was just incredible. You know, you, he wins the first race and you think, oh, well, that's all right. Um, he wins the second race and you think, oh, blimey, you know, quick fire double for de Tori. He wins the third race and you're thinking, whoa, great. I mean, I'm, I, all I'm thinking, I've, I've got my intro. You know, I've got my story, yes. you know, it doesn't really matter now. You've got a bit better, didn't you? And then it went to four, <laughs> yeah. and you think, five, and they're thinking, no, he can't do seven. Anyway, the six and then the seven, and, uh, oh, absolute pandemonium broke out. Next question, Bob. How do you bet on No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't think I tipped any of the winners. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, I mean, the... I, 
the the stories that were coming out that day. <clears throat> Obviously, then nothing about the album, but I mean the bookies. They were. It's the first time I've known the bookies running for cover. Yeah. Yes. They were running for cover. Yes. I think was it Gary Wil- Gary Wiltshire? He lost seven figures. Yeah, incredible. Was that a weekday? Was that an August day when that? Uh, August day, August Saturday. 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 So, Saturday, yeah. So yeah. What, what could you get into the August on it? Uh, all, all I could do on the August, I, I, I don't think I got. I think I, I think I led off on when he'd done five. Hmm. I couldn't go any later. No, but even that was. Uh, and even that was that, pushing it. Yeah. Um, and then I mean the Mercury. I, I didn't did didn't do racing for the Mercury then, and uh, I think yeah, obviously. <clears throat> he took over the back page. This is the Throstle Club with Norman Bartlam and Bob Downing.